Hi everyone and welcome to TPA Global's webinar on Global TP Risk Management. We have two presenters today, uh, Igor Peters and Perenda Sharma. Uh, both of them are partners in Amsterdam office of Transfer Pricing Associates. Perenda has uh, an overall experience of about 15 years working in UK, India, US and the Netherlands. He has worked on more than 300 clients in India and overseas, providing them a range of transfer pricing services such as effective tax planning assignments, APA, dispute resolution, thin capitalization, loan and guarantee fee benchmarking, and various other such projects. Our second presenter, Igor, who is also a partner at uh, Transfer Pricing Associates office in Amsterdam, has over 18 years of experience in international tax and transfer pricing. He has worked both as an in-house tax counsel in Germany and Netherlands, with a focus on tax risk management and transfer pricing. Uh, he has heavily been involved in preparation of uh, negotiation, preparation and negotiation of advanced pricing arrangements and provision of transfer pricing advisory services in corporate mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures. With this background, uh, I now invite the two presenters to start. And uh, a request to all uh, attendees, please keep your questions for the end and you can post them in the chat box and our presenters will uh, attend to your questions towards the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Avisha. Thanks, Avisha. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, as you know, that the topic for uh, today's uh, webinar is uh, Global TP Risk uh, Management. And uh, in this topic, we will be covering what do we mean by uh, uh, risk management in the context of transpressing. We will also be sharing uh, the few examples uh, which are uh, practical examples so that we know that how the, the, the reality matches with the theory because it is important for us to see uh, what uh, life situations can be and how a company should uh, address those situations through proper risk management. And then we will move on to uh, TPA's practical approach to TPA governance because we, we, we help for clients to how to uh, uh, develop a control framework. It's not only developing it, but also implementing it. That is also very important. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, we will uh, share with you uh, a practical case uh, where uh, we did a, a, a kind of risk management analysis on, on our case. And then uh, it will be a kind of a TP in control assessment which means that what was desired uh, for, uh, based on the existing state of the risk management framework uh, for a company and then how what steps uh, was taken to achieve that required stage. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, I give uh, uh, the floor to my colleague uh, Igor who will be taking through uh, uh, various slides and we'll try to make this uh, discussion interactive where I would be adding a few points, he will be adding a few points so that we make this uh, discussion more practical uh, rather than on the theory. Yes, Igor. Okay, thank you very much. So let's move on to the next slide, introduction to governance and transfer pricing. And to give you a little bit uh, background, there's of course a record search of data disclosure, I think C by C and other similar forms like TP forms and uh, all the accounting fraud scandals. Um, currently, uh, we're in economic stagnation, so costs are being squeezed, uh, markets are being, uh, being getting smaller. So that's one of the reasons to have your risk management structure in place. Uh, but, but quite often, if you look at these scandals, the control mechanism in practice still is pretty weak. So for who are you doing this? And you have different stakeholders which all have uh, different expectations. So what is actually uh, tax and TP governance? And if you look at the, the triangle, there are three important elements in building up your uh, governance uh, structure. And I think the first one is goals. What are the strategy goals and aims for 
tax and TP department. Uh, think of um, goals like there should be a certain limit or maximum ETR or effective tax rate or one of the goals can be you should be fully compliant and connected to that and you, you try to develop okay how can we do this in practice so there we arrive with the other element control how our tax risks manage and how is the progress against the goals that have been set being monitored. Well, perhaps a lot of you have more experience being in a US or US related environment where you've already met, I guess, the, the controls that should be in place for the so-called SOX or Sarbanes-Oxley uh, uh, legislation. Uh, but Igor, again, I just first go, want to go back to goals and Goal setting is very important when we have to uh, develop a TP governance framework and uh, goals could be where a company wants to have the ETR optimization which is kind of not the right word in today's, uh, in today's environment but mm -hmm. then at the same time one company will have a high risk appetite uh, which means that uh, unless they get a, a notice uh, from the tax officer they will not have, they will not maintain their TP documentation because the law also doesn't require to have a TP documentation on contemporaneous basis, in, you know, in in totality. So, uh, so what do you, what's your view on that? Uh, on goals, should they be like, uh, could be risky for one company, could be less risky for another company, or are we moving to a world where we are looking at goals which are more subdued now because of so much media coverage, because of changes brought by BAPS, so are we moving to a, a world where we're going to have a kind of a, uh, less risky goals? Is that you, you think will be important when designing a governance framework? I think, uh, yeah, mo most uh, goals are, are, are set within your tax and transfer pricing policy, which, which on its turn is based then on the corporate governance uh, policy. And the policy might already state that uh, our company only does uh, business in a kind of fair trade or fair uh, manner and tries to comply or will comply with all local uh, legislation where we do business. And then and having it more uh, explicit in your TP and tax policy, it might state, okay, we are um, com fully compliant in all the countries where we do um, business, and then you get to the, the you can even specify being compliant. Uh, the, the current discussions, I think, are focusing on are you legally compliant or are you perhaps uh, ethically or morally uh, compliant? Uh, not everything that is legal is currently the current climate perceived as being uh, the right thing to do. So there you could, could already say, well, we don't look for uh, uh, potential loopholes. We try to obey the law. And, and based on that, uh, any tax planning we do should have a backup uh, opinion of uh, a yeah, renowned tax advisor that will state this structure is uh, more likely than not to be kept or kept upright during a tax audit and if you're doing something that is yeah, discovering new areas uh, perceived as uh, aggressive because you know this will be scrutinized and will be challenged by uh, a tax inspector when, when well, he realizes the structure is set up yeah, then, then some companies might, might still pursue it and know they have to litigate for 10 years and other companies uh, will, will have a policy stating we don't do it if it's not uh, bigger than 50% chance and it's backed up by an opinion. And uh, on, only then we feel uh, compliant. So it's a wide range if you look at, I think, the, the appetite for risk where, where you're referring to is, is relatively high, I think, in, in, in private equity uh, business and, and 
much less, of course, in publicly owned because then it, it it's in the it's out there, it's in the public. You have to report it to your uh, SEC yeah. committee, for yeah. instance. You Absolutely. Don't want that. Okay. And I, I think if I take this goals to uh, to to the next level, where I should have, if I have a right control mechanism in place, if I have slightly uh, uh, risky goals, but if at the same time I have the right control mechanism in place, which means that if tomorrow I know that I I'm taking this aggressive position. But then, if that aggressive position goes beyond a certain point, if I have a full control that if tomorrow an uh, audit starts, say, in a local country, then, you know, there's a proper responsibility uh, and control profile is already there in, in the system within the organization, then I can still control my risk. So, I think it's, it's a control uh, factor is also very important where I'm more aggressive, but I, I'm still able to control it. So that uh, ultimately the risk real realization is actually not uh, impacting the organization so much. No, depending on your goals, and I think a lot of uh, in-house people will recognize that uh, that your uh, CFO uh, will uh, set one one target for you. No surprises. Uh, that that's something I guess you can only do within this setting of, of the goal you can pursue a uh, very aggressive tech strategy but then yeah it's not a surprise anymore that you are being challenged and scrutinized during an audit and uh, yeah. in that way i think expectations are, are meeting again within your, your goal setting yeah and, and then at the same time uh, the next uh, the next area in typical governance is communication. So it's very important that how the whole communication uh, system has been uh, set up within the organization. Uh, that means that uh, if tomorrow uh, uh, there's a big notice in a local country, how that is fitted back into, into the system. So if we have, say, local CFOs, right, how they are reporting back to group CFO. So is there a proper uh, what we call that uh, RACI response, uh, who's responsible, who's accountable, who should be informed, who should have a control. So uh, that is very important, especially in, in today's environment where there should be a very strong communication system uh, within the organization and people should be assigned with the responsibility. So that is a, a, a third important part of the, the whole TP governance framework. Yeah, and no, also uh, there you see the communication uh, uh, policy, uh, like like something like like documentation retention policy or document distribution uh, policy is again based on uh, the, the the general or more general corporate uh, governance policy, and that's also applied then locally. So you get this notice and that the tax audit is starting and locally perhaps uh, depending on your your risk for appetite you know already oh these elements will be challenged uh, because it was part of the risky strategy we're pursuing where you consider everything well 100 percent compliant so you expect actually no uh, no no surprises and that's i think already a part of the same communication you're sharing between the tax and the finance department uh, when you're making all your tax accounting uh, yeah. calculations. And I think we will cover a few of these uh, uh, theoretical aspects in our examples where the failure happened later in the slides. Yeah, I have to, to continue with the, the, the various stakeholders on uh, slide number six. And that, that will also influence your communication who are, are uh, well, dependent on you. You have shareholders, investors, and they expect a certain net profit. And what is then the, the last column? We have a column with uh, tax responsibility. And they expect to optimize your tax position and as low as possible ETR. And how, how old fashioned it might sound, that's principally what shareholders uh, expect. Then there are uh, more outside stakeholders like the analysts, financial analysts, banks. They expect transparency and also they expect a uh, good grip and an in-depth overview of your ETR, what's happening in your uh, tax cash position 
and uh, what are your, your notes on uh, tax risk position. Another external uh, stakeholder, tax authorities, of course, what do they want? And, uh, yeah apply a cost reduction on their audits. Uh, they want to see there is a fair share being paid, so they also try to do it as efficiently as possible. And therefore, their, their expectation is, uh, for example, more and more countries doing this, having an enhanced relationship so they can focus on the, the risky parts and everything else that, that process-wise and risk-wise is already compliant, yeah, does not need uh, that much attention anymore. And you could, uh, when I get, you made a very good point on this uh, shareholders, uh, investors, their expectation, and uh, let's uh, let's accept that for them it's important to have uh, uh, maximizing uh, uh, profit after tax, right? And a tax optimization is something is always expected because at the end of the day, shareholder wants their dividends and appreciation in, in their share price. Uh, which is a very strong factor even for a CEO uh, who stay in, in a big company, in a big group, will actually depend on uh, obviously how possibly the share price is performing, right? Uh, and uh, one of the key factor is that how much profits uh, uh, that that CEO is bringing to the table, and so that investors are, investors and shareholders are happy. But at the same time, because of we have already seen uh, you know a few cases where uh, the image of, of a group was impacted, for example, by by uh, not paying right taxes and consumers, they stopped, kind of started reducing buying their products. So that is also indirectly impacting uh, companies. But when I look at this, uh, I'm linking this discussion to this base erosion profit shifting BAPS uh, project, which OECD did, and we already saw the final output October last year and before that, there were still a lot of kind of fancy tax structures available where some companies they were able to do it, have a very high profit after tax, and investors are happy, shareholders are happy. So is it right to say that uh, post BAPS, in the post, post BAPS world, we will see less distortions uh, in the expectation of shareholders between, between the expectation of shareholders and the expectation of, for example, of tax authorities because uh, you know, there will not be much uh, fancy structures available now, and there will be some kind of convergence in paying the right tax uh, by corporates. Yeah, good, good question. I think that's yeah, dependent in what uh, market you're operating. I think if you're operating in a consumer market, and uh, think of, of uh, soft drinks or, or uh, coffee. Yeah, there, there. You're confronted with consumers that might react very critical on your tech behavior, also on your other social behavior, or you're in um, yeah, more and more, yeah, for at least for consumers, hidden market, which is more B2B with with uh, much less exposure, and where where there's fierce price competition, and actually there there is less, I think, yeah, moral aspects of the product, but more about the technical quality and, and price. Yeah, I think in that, that part still, yeah, the, the tendency will be at least a little bit higher than in the more market-related products for still for, for tax planning. Yeah. Even after, after BEPS, I think BEPS will eradicate a lot of it, but of course not everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially with uh, your, your stakeholder, shareholder, investor, exactly there, you can, can make the balance between your risk for appetite and balance it against uh, uh, more and more important, I think, reputation damage risk. Uh, they are now, due to the transparency, almost fully connected. And uh, I have not seen the latest uh, C by C European C by C discussions, whether it is public or not, yeah, sure. not, the, not yet. But that might might just give it this last push to to fully, yeah, go go away almost from tax planning in consumer markets. But I would imagine that there will be better alignment uh, between uh, these stakeholders in the future because if you have less fancy structures, uh, you have 
better alignment, but I agree that where uh, the company is most sensitive to media, most sensitive to public opinion, right, there the alignment will be, will happen much faster. Yeah, I think I, I read it yesterday that was uh, around Caterpillar. It was a news article about Caterpillar having a TP structure in place uh, where they uh, at least try to, on paper apparently, move and uh, profit shift some profits to uh, Switzerland without having a real operational change in their structure. And so the so-called uh, value creators did not move out of the US. And what I read yesterday is that now actually some shareholders are suing the, uh, I think the tax advisor, but also partly the directors that, that were behind this uh, and say, well, if you do it like that, that's so uh, dilettante-like or amateuristic way of <laughs> tax planning, you're, you're almost fraudulent. And that's, I think, uh, the, the, the extreme effect of, of transparency and people but it's not liking it. It's anymore. a double-edged sword because uh, if the, 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 the CEO does not deliver right uh, results, like higher post after tax, then you know he can he will be penalized you know possibly to showing him the exit door that you know you're not like, delivering a good profit after tax but here it's again uh, there's a loss now because uh, there will be some tax penalties now and that's why I think uh, shareholders have a problem now in, in the case you just described. Yeah, I think there there that's interesting before hey, you would uh, like like we stated expectations of shareholders investors investors, yeah, high net profit, and perhaps now there is also the, uh, that gives extreme pressure, I think, on companies to perform and at least to consider tax planning. And now the, the other side is, is also taken into account that this can only be, be pursued with or at the cost of a high risk. Yep. And, and now yeah, shareholders, investors, also don't want, uh, we put it in, in uh, row number five, they don't want tax surprises. Uh, it's, it's not good for their uh, share value also. Yeah. And so let's move on to yeah. the uh, next slide. And there is currently, a therefore, a strong call for corporate responsibility uh, on tax. Uh, it's no more that only financial reporting alone satisfies the needs of the various stakeholders uh, that are uh, interested in it. It's not any more a pure legal concept, as, as mentioned before. Also, ethical values can and should be uh, considered. I think uh, yesterday the, the two persons that were causing the so-called Luke's leak. Uh, they, they can still consider themselves uh, yeah, that they helped creating more ethical value and, and yeah, the fact that they were stealing uh, information from a company yeah, was, was in their view uh, for the better. Yeah. And, and Igor, we were discussing uh, you know, about one example you know, before we started this presentation of that IP. Uh, we have seen in many cases intellectual properties registered in a tax-free location and uh, we do not have substance, we have possibly one or two full-time employees there. So if I look at this box, you know, these uh, four uh, colorful mm -hmm. boxes, uh, if I if I take a case where we have an intellectual property and where the legal owner is also the economic owner means that that legal owner also develops IP, enhance IP, uh, you know, protects the IP, uh, it performs all these DEMPI functions as we call in the OCD uh, jargon, so uh, where we gonna put that profile? So I would, I would imagine that if the substance and legal, legal, legal form, then it would be in the first box where we are saying that this is a tax reduction is legal and uh, welcome because uh, I'm locating that IP in that country and I have tax benefits, but then I have substance also. But then, if I uh, if I if I move to the next box, which is avoidance, is technically legal, right? So, what changes would you expect in the structure? 
So am I saying that as I move down from first box to second, third, fourth box, or not fourth, from first to second and third box, I'm actually less on economic substance, right? And when I'm in, on fourth box, even my legal ownership will be challenged. So they're kind of, I'm saying I'm a legal owner of the IP and our IP actually is a kind of non-existence or it doesn't exist to that level. Yeah, that, that's especially I think with uh, IP, of course, it's interesting if you uh, move it on paper to this company, which uh, does not perform, as you mentioned, uh, then pay functions, but is a pure legal owner. Uh, consider any uh, tax haven usually or a zero uh, tax company. And then still, this, this company can be entitled legally to all the uh, usually royalties or royalty like income, but then uh, turning it back, this, this company should, uh, I think, share or, or distribute almost 99% uh, of its uh, profits or, or uh, IRR, intangible related return, and, and yeah, uh, do a kind of profit split with all the Dempe functions performing uh, places within this uh, multinational. Yeah. So from a TP point of view, uh, you're almost in the red box, I think, illegal structure. And, and perhaps from a tax point of view, yeah, you're still in a, in a legal position. And that, that's interesting, I think, in the, in the Caterpillar case, uh, they're, they're, I think they, they, they yeah, did not take into account for as part of this uh, Dempe functions or significant people function um, element. So suddenly, yeah, you move into the red box. It's, it's, uh, it's but again, I would, I would say that illegal is something which is, you're totally going against the law. And the challenge in transfer passing is that, uh, you know, it's not, an exact, exact science, it's an art. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, we want objective outcomes uh, because I can say that, uh, uh, you know, even if I have a less number of people still have some level of substance, I think I will put in the red box, it's illegal where virtually substance is zero. And I own the IP, but I'm getting all rewards, uh, sending rewards to that location where there's only the legal owner of the IP then I think it would be possibly fall in that category. Otherwise, uh, there's a lot of subjectivity involved where we still have few people, but then how to say that, how much portions of dampy functions they are assuming in that, in that location. Okay, illegal is really yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. fraudulent part. Yeah, it's hiding. Yeah, hiding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. So let, let's uh, have some... Uh, Examples. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in the next portion of this uh, presentation, we have uh, we have uh, listed few examples, and these examples are based on our practical experience. And these examples they remind us that it is so important to have a control framework in place. Uh, and when we are in day-to-day -day tax activities, sometimes few actions are taken, uh, for example, by a local office, and that leads to a much bigger problem. Uh, well, uh, later on, so this is one case of a uh, of of a company which uh, which uh, uh, had office in Asia and uh, it's a, a subsidiary of a German headquartered group, and uh, the Germany was supplying semi-finished goods to this Asia Asia Co, and Asia Co was doing some value add and uh, selling this product to customers in the local territory. Now, as per the local rules of that country, uh, the Asia Co was supposed to maintain and prepare TP documentation on a contemporaneous basis, which means the documentation, documentation was supposed to be ready before the filing of tax return. And uh, because the size of business was so small in that local country, the managing director of the local country were, had virtually a lot of responsibility, even signing Sign, giving sign off to the TP documentation, even giving sign off to local TP forms. Although the group was uh, in Europe, it was a very very big group, but in that local country, the business was small. So initially, they they had very few employees. So that's why MD assumed a lot of responsibility. And and uh, uh, their uh, own own documents, or was that something provided by the headquarters? 
they were own documents there were some some uh, backups but the the fact was that the documentation was supposed to prepare as per local requirements so local comparables local benchmarks local report style all that and uh, this managing director did not have any uh, had a very little clue about tax he was with engineering background and then when and they hired a local consultant because operations were small and local consultant also did not have the required knowledge uh, uh, on transfer pricing and then the case went to uh, went for went for audit and there they went the inspector asked that did you uh, prepare this uh, documentation documentation on contrapreneurs basis and and did, did could not answer which way he should respond because there are penalty provisions and then when the officer he was able to uh, he could feel that there is some problem with the documentation and he said please uh, uh, give me your observations on oath and uh, and that was something uh, quite damaging because uh, finally uh, it came to uh, the conclusion that uh, the documentation was not uh, prepared on contrapreneurs basis and even the previous years were opened up uh, in audit so if you look at multiple years there was a big big exposure for for the group and the 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 the, the, the key problem in this whole case was that there was no uh, a good uh, raci uh, uh, concept in place which is who was responsible who was accountable who who was controlling it and who should be informed because if the raci uh, responsibility profile was set up properly if the control mechanism was set up properly somebody in the headquarter already would have already known that who's handling tp documentation who if whether that person has the required knowledge or not so this is very important that uh, where we have small operations in foreign countries we should be mindful of even those operations and put them in our whole control framework because in one year they have small operation but if the exposure is becomes bigger covers multiple years then it's a big problem yeah have a stronger centralized lead on on, yeah. on this yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And where we're and where centralized uh, business configurations are being uh, well more and more scrutinized, of course. And one example is where you have an IP company which receives 50% of the whole operating margin of the whole chain the chain then being in this uh, graph from supplier to customer uh, where you give remuneration to your uh, cost center contractors uh, that do uh, contract manufacturing or contract uh, R&D and you give some uh, revenue center based remuneration to your sales service hubs uh, that do the sales do the marketing and in the center, the profit center, you are the matchmaker between them. But still, because of the people functions are in the blue zone, you might still have a very low functionality and very low significant people function available. Yeah, is it then very reasonable to expect and the, the the, the outskirts, the blue blocks, to be remunerated on a cost plus five in this example, or just on a very low operating margin of of two percent. And where where can you find this then in your risk control framework? Most likely, of course, in in one of the the tests are within your uh, TP documentation or your TP design already uh, that you should see. Oh, this is one is the profit center. Are we actually, uh, are there, is the, the conduct in line with the, the contracts you will have with your uh, cost centers and the contracts you will have with your revenue center? So you can do an uh, in house estimation already where whether your conduct is aligned with the agreements and immediately uh, you should discover there is no uh, significant people function available yeah. Yeah. and Igor uh, uh, we have seen many times that when we do analysis we look at what margins should be should be earned by the entity we are testing 
right? So whether it's a distributor or a contract manufacturer, and then we say this entity gets so much margin. And then we move to a revenue center, like distributor. Distributor should get so much margin. And when we do this, at times we we reach a conclusion that there's hardly anything left for the residual uh, profit taker, which is the principal. But in our case, it's the opposite. Now, it is very important for a company to also do a value chain analysis, and some portion of that analysis will now go into the master file, new style master file, but not full-blown analysis. But it is important to know that how much profits are earned in the value chain. And then check that uh, am I taking, am I keeping too much profit with uh, the company who, is, who should take residual profits or with entities who are more like cost centers or revenue centers? Because today, uh, uh, TP transpressing tools like country by country reporting, master file, they would give enough food to tax authorities to actually identify these type of uh, situations and uh, you know uh, make initial uh, view on whether to conduct audit or not. So in the old days, uh, you know uh, we could still imagine that local country. Uh, TP files submissions were more in silos, but now given the fact that we have C by C, and you were also mentioning about C by C reporting, what is uh, coming through uh, e, uh, to European Commission, when we see all this, uh, you know, the data availability will be uh, too high, and uh, the local tax authorities can easily uh, pick up these type of cases. Yeah, in this this case, uh, the fact that there is so much more transparency will immediately uh, trigger your your uh, risks. Okay, let's move on to slide number. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and this is a uh, another uh, important case uh, uh, where uh, the issue was of audit trail. And uh, this is again a case of a, of a, of a company which was in emerging market, and uh, the uh, the supplier was a group company in France supplying components after buying from a third party, and uh, in in many cases they were supplying a cost to cost to 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 a group company in in, in Latin America, and uh, which was uh, selling finished goods to customers. Now. This Latin uh, Latin company was more like a, a joint venture. There was a local player, and I have seen that when we have a situation where joint venture is covered, uh, and uh, the joint venture has to produce a TP documentation. Generally, there's there, generally there is less cooperation from the foreign partner because there are also local uh, uh, partners' view and their own stakes involved. So uh, documentation at times is not very robust. And in this case, uh, when uh, the JV partner was there locally, and when JV was in existence, then uh, uh, so documentation was submitted on certain basis, and no audit happened. And because the local JV partner, uh, they were regularly representing before the tax officer, and they were able to justify their case uh, in the required manner. But then, when the foreign uh, uh, partner bought the local JV partner stake. And then when it became wholly owned subsidiary, then uh, after that, the, the tax inspector, he picked up the audit and he asked for all those details from the foreign country, from, from foreign company in France. And they said, please provide me back-to-back -back invoices for, for this uh, third-party uh, vendor supplies because you use the cup method. And when, uh, when uh, 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 the, the Indian wholly owned subsidiary, which was wholly owned subsidiary now, when it went back to France and asked for detail, they said uh, the people who were managing this, they left company two years back and we are unable to locate the hard copies and we didn't scan them. So the message here is that, uh, again, we are back to uh, TP control framework, TP risk management, how that is happening within a, within a group. Uh, do we have a proper uh, 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 allocation of responsibilities? Do we have a, a proper digitization of, uh, of files, hard files? Because automation is again another thing uh, where which will uh, make us to move from hard copies to uh, digitized version. So it is very important uh, for, a, for a group to have that control mechanism in place because uh, in, during later years when few people have already left, it's so difficult to go back and 
dig out information. So that is again one example I thought uh, which is quite practical and it's important and it can uh, uh, occur in any other uh, group, uh, in, a, in any other organization uh, or maybe it's a mid-size or a big organization. Yeah, so, so and the, the control mechanism here would have been to apply or, or have already uh, applicable a proper document retention policy. Yes, and and uh, again, uh, if they are following a cup method, is this is this method as per the global TP policy? Because when you have a local JV partner, it's not easy to uh, push that local JV partner to abide by uh, by their overall local you know, group wide policies. Because then you have local incentives also. Because local JV partner also wants to have his own profits, you know. So in a way, you can say it's a more like a third-party transaction. But then, local in certain countries, local laws are so strict that they even cover a, a transaction uh, between a JV partners as uh, related party transaction. Yeah, very, very uh, yeah, no, nasty example. Yeah, let's go to uh, next slide. The the leakage uh, example, eh, where there are non-US IP rights that are structured via um, so-called hybrid entity. Uh, I think most of you will uh, recognize this uh, famous computer uh, company. And there are uh, so-called white incomes being collected here in the XYZ Ireland holdings which was established in Ireland, but actually was being managed in Bermuda, so it was not a resident of Ireland anymore. And there you have the structure which uh, Netherlands Holdings BV uh, took a license for the, the IP and was paying royalties to the Ireland Holdings. And there was also the companies outside the, the US and that took a sub license from this uh, Ireland limited company. So this is a typically uh, structure fully driven on managing your uh, effective tax rate. So without going through the technical analysis uh, of it, I think we should uh, uh, recognize that this structure principally and legally it's 100% correct and also from a transfer pricing perspective uh, it looks pretty uh, solid. So you would expect tax authorities cannot attack this anymore in an uh, audit situation. However, if you uh, consider the uh, BEPS actions, I think especially uh, for render, you were referring to uh, action 8910 and the, the Dempe functions you mentioned already. How can you explain this structure to the outside world where the technical or tax technical knowledge is not readily uh, available and they can just see uh, that no or low taxes were being paid where the company overall makes a solid profit. And you see there the tension between uh, appetite for risk, yeah, as this is a uh, oh, much more risk appetite-like uh, structure, and the balance you have to make with, in this case, being in a consumer market with uh, the reputational risk you are taking. Uh, although your, your shareholder might be very happy with uh, extreme low ETR, so suddenly you have influence from what is the correct tax bill and yeah, what is your role in that uh, under the header corporate responsibility, which, which of course is important in this uh, consumer market you're operating in. So how can it be that the company gets its uh, tax situation under control and even worse that it's uh, openly uh, being discussed or forced to discuss it without having an immediate uh, reputation damage issue. So I think there in, in advance already uh, in your policy you should have set boundaries and, and make a kind of what if uh, scenarios. 
and, and prepare yourself like, like yeah, brace yourself if, if you're taking a high risk then then yeah, perhaps going back to the stakeholder overview the, the category no surprises uh, if, is it really a no surprise or was it uh, something luring already upon you but then you got, uh, we are again back to that uh, goal setting which means uh, what's my goal do I have a very high risk appetite as my goal and if that is the case then uh, am I uh, still accepting the structures so it is very important uh, for, for a group to identify uh, or to actually uh, agree on what goals they want to set for their organization and uh, uh, con considering that uh, these type of structures uh, would, would have a more and more problem in the coming time so one has to actually align the goals also as per changing the uh, regulations and also uh, expectations for, uh, from various stakeholders. Yeah, take into account uh, yeah. depending on, on your market, yeah. your uh, yeah, possible reputation damage, your, your ETR target, yeah. and uh, how can, can you do that in this case? Yeah, you have to be uh, very thorough in, in reviewing your yeah, the, the goal you've set and uh, the process you've set, uh, where is your uh, TP uh, alignment bound into the whole control framework. And I think the other example, I'm not sure, I don't think we have a slide on that, uh, where a contract was being signed with, uh, by a company with a third party, and initially the, uh, the, the delivery, so-called INCO term was uh, DDU, and then the client asked for uh, a different uh, place of delivery and instead let's assume for example it was the uh, harbor of Rotterdam in the free trade zone the customer asked the, the company oh why don't you deliver it actually into our warehouse it's only 20 kilometers from the harbor and there was no and they, they easily changed the contract but without uh, a consult of, of the, in this case then the tax and TP department and what actually happened then the uh, condition changed from DDU and uh, duties delivered unpaid to uh, DDP delivery so suddenly the company was confronted with well at least in advance pay uh, import VAT pay uh, import duties and yeah any available or, or at least in front upfront calculated uh, profit uh, evaporated the whole contract ended up in, uh, in uh, being in a lost position or a lost contract for the company which, which simply is yeah, part of your control framework if you change uh, something that, that to, to your agreements yeah, you should have all departments reviewing this contract and not consider it locally it made sense of course oh it's only 20 kilometers away but uh, simple changes can have a drastic uh, also tax or TP effect yeah, but yeah uh, you got, it's a very good example and that's how we see how commercial decisions sometimes impact the profitability of a company because of uh, other tax costs which actually emerge when we we come to come to the actual situation but the fact is that uh, at times when you run a business it is not always uh, possible to go back and check with your tax team hey tell me is this one decision right because this, sometimes business decision happen very fast so I would again assume that uh, it, it would be a part of the control framework that if we have a transaction say for example above this threshold then you know if you are deviating from the norm then you go back and talk to somebody in the tax team but if it is if it has to happen on a very regular basis then it 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 in a way hampers uh, you know the way the business is run because you know business or commercial people they move very fast sometimes especially when you have to uh, click the deals and you have to very quick yeah, there, there. Uh, you can set perhaps as, as part of your uh, framework already a range of possible options with uh, possible tax or TP effects, and then business can uh, make their own choice. Are you 
done your homework uh, in front. So now, and let's go to some uh, practical uh, approaches to governance. So now, in on this slide, uh, what we are sharing is that to to move to a higher effic higher efficiency uh, 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 in preparing TP uh, documentation. Uh, it is important for an organization to first have uh, best practices uh, within the TP organization setup, uh, and that means that uh, thus a, a company has a proper uh, responsibility, accountability, uh, control, and uh, and who's who's to be informed for what decision is in place. Has the company identified people in tax team, in finance team? Uh, uh, in, in, in information technology team, what decisions they have to take, what accountability they have, that is that is very, very important uh, for a company before it can move to a higher efficiency. And, and this whole mechanism is part of uh, developing a robust control framework. Uh, and then uh, a company can also think of using certain tools, for example, is one tool uh, which we uh, we use at TPA is we call that as country risk matrix, which actually helps clients to check uh, in which or local uh, countries they should prepare documentation now or they should prepare at the time when they get notice. So those type of internal tools they really help, and it is also important as part of the TP organizational best practices that. The, the communication uh, internally and externally should be very clear. So which means that if a notice is received by the CFO uh, in local country, then how that uh, that information is passed up uh, to group CFO. So that uh, communication channel should be very clear. So once we have a, a, a very good TP organizational uh, setup, then we can move to uh, uh, adopting uh, TP operational best practices, which means that uh, the company should uh, or the group should aim to have a, a layered approach in producing uh, TP documentation. I have seen even today many clients when they come to us, they say, "Can you prepare local file for this country or that country?" But then uh, in those occasions, uh, uh, the master file is not there or there is no uh, worldwide uh, policy in place. So it is important that uh, uh, by looking at Action 13, which has in a way given a, a very good opportunity to corporates to actually standardize their TP documentations. So to start with, have a master file which has to be uh, uh, submitted to tax authorities across the globe as per Action 13 guidance. Then a local file should be there. Again, that can be based on a bigger template, and that template can help in producing local files for many countries. And then TP forms are also very important uh, because uh, uh, what we are feeling in TP forms that will also have a reflection on what we what data we are giving in country by country reporting. So which is the fourth uh, layer. So it is important that uh, 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 when we follow this approach, it brings a standardization. And when it brings standardization, then we can move to the next stage, which is rationalization of TP production cycles, which means that there we can decide that uh, how much portion of that we can automate it. Can we automate country by country reporting? Can we automate uh, 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 master file local file creation? And yes, in today's uh, world we can do it because Action 13, again I'm saying, Action 13 has given us that opportunity to, to do that. And, uh, and it is also important for us to see that whether we should have a, a more control at center because uh, we believe that we can either have cent centralization model where uh, people in the headquarter they have more control, or we can have a decentralized model where we give a lot of powers to re uh, regional CFOs. But uh, again, I, I was recently working on a client where they wanted to have control centrally, but they had very less people uh, because the group was in cost cutting drive and there were only three people uh, in their uh, tax team. So what we actually developed was that we said, let's create a very good RACI, uh, RACI model where you should assign responsibilities and then you can still control while sitting in the headquarter. So a lot of responsibilities are given to uh, people in the regional locations and local locations. And then 
so with that uh, kind of setup and with automation, we believe that uh, uh, TP compliance cycle uh, uh, could possibly become 50% more efficient. So this whole framework can actually help not only in bringing efficiency, but also bringing a better control within the organization from a transpassing standpoint. Yeah, I think the, the, this is a nice one you mentioned. Uh, apply ISO standards, and uh, we have several clients that apply this uh, ISO standard for internal service charges. And the benefit of it is you have on one hand a very strict and, and uh, yeah, strong process, and it also helped to convince or, or give comfort actually to the external uh, accountant. So no need for him to dig into that matter because the, the ISO standard was there or ISO certificate uh, was there. And also it gave a lot of comfort to the, the tax inspector during an audit. Okay, this is uh, a very proper and appropriate allocation of those charges. So no need to look in that also anymore. And I think that uh, one of the, the elements you already mentioned when you're making your uh, master file, but especially local files, and to make it more efficient, I think a good tool is, of course, this uh, step one, the, the CRM, the country risk matrix, uh, based on uh, um, amounts at stake, uh, how many days you have to deliver your local uh, file, and what uh, granularity do you have to deliver uh, data when asked by the and you're during a tax audit by the tax inspector. And in which language do you need to provide the data? And based on that, you can make uh, yeah, a pretty good uh, tax calendar and when to produce all your uh, documents. So let's move to the next one. Uh, so the next slide we have. Uh, TP control framework, uh, it's, it's in, in more detailed form where in the previous slide we were sharing that how, what steps we need to follow to, to have uh, the right uh, uh, efficient model in place uh, uh, for transfer passing. So uh, there we have uh, uh, four elements are very key, which is people. People means uh, uh, the team, uh, tax team, finance team, what qualification they have, what experience they have, what responsibility they have. And the the, uh, the next is a workflow, which means that which which all elements we have to take care of in developing a good TP system. So should we follow benchmark for benchmark search for each country, or should we have global uh, uh, or regional benchmark searches? Again, Action 13 provides that platform now, and also Action 8, 10 guidance, uh, which came out uh, uh, last year, that also uh, helps us in actually uh, standardizing the uh, uh, intra-group services where you have cost plus 5% markup, so you don't need to uh, prepare a benchmark for that. So uh, it's more like routine services. So one can, uh, the company can decide uh, how they manage their benchmarking process. Uh, and then also, what about financial data? Uh, because financial data will be very important. That has to be provided uh, and uh, uh, part of country by country reporting. So. That is also an uh, important uh, part of the workflow. And then uh, software uh, is also very important uh, for automating the TP system for the group. So software can, uh, which software to use will depend on uh, what need a company has. So do we need a software only for automating country by country reporting? Or do we need software to also automating uh, for creating uh, local files and master files. So it entirely depends on how much standardization a group has. If there is a very good standardization, standardization of TP documentation within the group, then one can also automate a TP documentation creation. One can also automate creation of country by country reporting. I and think then that, that's perhaps also where we're. And that works perfectly, the chat function. <coughs> Sorry, the, the, the question. question from the audience yeah. uh, came. Uh, would it make sense for a large organization to have a global coordinated document, which then can be localized based, based on each country requirements? I think yeah, that's exactly yeah, the, yeah, the example you give yes. if you have this. Yes. Yeah, whether it's software based or, yeah. or uh, 
I don't wear it uh, based. Yeah, yeah but, that very uh, much makes yeah. sense to me. And uh, you guys, are oh, you already aware that we are we are helping clients where we have uh, through our, our this automation solution. Uh, there's a repository of data which has a, a big uh, uh, TP file template and which has got a lot of meat in it and then that helps in creating local files depending upon the need of that local country and certain level of access is given to uh, people in local countries so that they can uh, uh, actually use that portion and create local file but at the same time uh, what they're creating locally also should be in line with the group policy. So three things will be very, very important in the coming years. One is centralization. Centralization doesn't mean don't give any power to local people, but is there enough control? Okay. Centralization of responsibility, centralization of decision making, but with the right required level of control being assigned to local entities. Second will be standardization, which means uh, how fast a company can move to these uh, four layers of documentation. That will be very important. So once we have achieved standardization, then yes, we can move to a third element, which is automation. Because without first two, uh, achieving automation uh, would possibly not bring that level of efficiency of to the extent of 50% uh, possible reduction in cost of uh, TP compliance in terms of preparing, creating uh, documentation. Yeah, uh, or, or even more huh? referring again to this uh, ISO uh, standards uh, currently being applied yeah. and uh, quarter charges. Yeah. Uh, why check every yeah. month yeah. Your, your charges yeah. when you can have your software yeah. doing it automatically? Yeah, and just to complete my this slide, the last element is reporting, uh, which means that uh, how uh, the communication is uh, is being uh, uh, is provided to uh, uh, provided to central team by local team. Uh, do we have a dashboard uh, uh, which is provided to CFO because CFO cannot get involved in a day-to-day -day affair, but there should be required level of information uh, which should reach CFO. Uh, and then is there a TP policy paper in place? Uh, because if we have a TP intercompany pricing policy, if they are, they are, uh, on different, uh, if they are in different documents, uh, they should be centralized and possibly uh, more, uh, they should look like more like a one TP policy paper. So uh, reporting of, of of the data, reporting of uh, of the uh, status quo of TP documentation is very important to have a proper uh, TP control framework. Okay, I think in the light of the time, uh, we we uh, skip the last two uh, slides, and I think what what's for you very interesting is. Uh, Chapter four, the TP yeah. in control assessment, yeah. uh, where uh, TPA developed a uh, tool to make a uh, yeah, pretty exact uh, estimation, and provide you with recommendations. Uh, so where are you in your? Uh, so what we do here is that yeah. we have we have a list of questions, and those list of questions uh, we ask uh, from the client. Uh, uh, on their TP systems, or level of documentation, level of control they have in place, and then on the basis of that, uh, on this slide, uh, slide number, uh, I'll just move to that slide. Uh, yes. So this slide, uh, on this slide, uh, we have uh, we have put key insights, and if you see this, it's a kind of a, a web, or kind of a cob web. So where you can see that uh, on the blue shaded portion, one zero one two three four tells us that uh, how good the company uh, is on its uh, TP system. So if I just go back uh, to previous slide, so if you see uh, on this previous slide, number one is it's a basic level of processes and ad hoc management system in place. Five is that they have state of the art practices and outcomes. That means they have a very strong control framework in place. So in this case, uh, we, 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 we actually use uh, uh, an example and that actually gave us uh, uh, the blue, if you look at the blue shaded portions, that tells us that where the company is on different elements of uh, workflows, TP workflows, which means uh, if on TP documentation we have point three, which is obviously uh, not bad, but it's not very good. And then if you see that sign off is close to zero, which means that uh, who's signing off, like in my example I shared before, the managing director was signing off. So he was signing off, but not the right person. 
So that is also important. So this whole analysis gives us a, a very good view on how uh, solid the TP risk man, uh, TP risk management of of an organization is in, in based, line with your yeah. your goals. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. so based on the question we ask, and then if I move to next slide, there uh, we we say that these are the key insights on various parameters uh, on various workflows, and then these are our recommendations, right? Uh, and then and then we do a gap analysis, which means uh, here we tell gap, and then uh, I'm just moving fast in the interest of time. Yeah, we, yeah, so I'll get, I'm back to this slide. So here we, we do a gap analysis and we also tell uh, clients that what they would like to do, what stage they want to take their TP system and to move to the TP system, we identify what gaps are there. We make give recommendations to the client so that they can make those changes. For example, they make more standardization or for example, uh, they move uh, they move to a, a, a global benchmarking platform so that they are more cost effective and they can yeah, they should yeah, move to automation so all those things help in actually uh, uh, making this uh, this whole uh, this uh, kind of a web more blue so yeah, which means wow. you are more towards four or or it's not possible to have be at five but that's goal but then more uh, area shaded in blue better for the company yeah, you've reached your, your goals. So I think with that, I'm just looking at the slides. Uh, it's just a slide on potential benefits of TP, TP governance assessment, which talks about how to be in, being in control and transparency is, transparency is very important. And uh, on the further slides, we have lesson learned, are you in control? So it talks about uh, whether you have corporate governance model in place. Do you have control framework in place? Uh, how the intellectual property policy is uh, documented because IP is very important nowadays where uh, a lot of discussion is hap happening on DMP functions. And then we have also attached to this uh, presentation Appendix A. Uh, this is illustration of, uh, uh, of, of, of TP in control assessment question. So the kind of question we ask to get answers to uh, from the client on uh, whether they have the required level of control on their TP system. So it's just a, a kind of uh, an example which will help you uh, uh, in actually uh, knowing what questions are relevant to know the answers uh, so that uh, to check whether a company has a better grip on their TP control framework or not. Yeah, how oh, wow. strong is it? Uh, yeah, so... So with that, uh, we are uh, we we are through with our presentation. So if the audience has any question, they can ask us now. They can text us, and uh, we are more than happy to answer. Okay. And the uh, slides we've used, including the uh, appendices you uh, saw, and we will put them on the website, and they should be available uh, within a couple of days on the website, including a recording of this uh, webinar. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, thank you very much patient attendance and speak to you soon.